God. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I want you to open with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, John chapter 15, and Matthew chapter 22. John chapter 3, John chapter 15, and Matthew 22. Because it's Valentine's Day, I had prayed and I wanted to speak for you to you for just a few moments on this thought, the greatest love, the greatest love. I want to tell you, I'm so thankful for the love of God. Can somebody say amen? I'm so thankful for the love of God. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me to honor the reading of God's word in John chapter 3. You want to look at verses 16 through 18. Then we'll go to John chapter 15. Very familiar passage of Scripture, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he who believes in Jesus is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Hallelujah. John chapter 15, verses 9 through 12. John chapter 15, verses 9 through 12. Verse 9 said, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Matthew 22, 36 through 39. Matthew 22, verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus answered and said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your touch. I thank you for your spirit and anointing that has already been felt here in this place. I thank you for the words that have already been spoken into our hearts. Father, I pray that we would hear the word of the Lord that has been given to us. Father, I pray now that you would speak to us through the remaining of this time. Let your word go forth and accomplish all that you desire. And we give you thanks for it all in Christ Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'm so thankful for just an obeying God and saying and tell you, you know, sometimes when we say the things that need to be said, people get upset, but sometimes you still have to say what needs to be said. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Glory to God. Valentine's Day is a great day. It's a special day for couples. It's one of those times throughout the year that, uh, you know, it's just a, it's about love and about romance, and uh, everybody looks forward to it, to their boyfriend, their girlfriend, their husband, their wife, and they want to uh, spend those moments together, and uh, it's an exciting time, and I'm thankful for the love that is shown on that day, but I want to talk to you today about the greatest love, the greatest love that has ever been given to anyone, and that's the love of God. In the Bible, you find uh, some wonderful things. You know, in our English language, language we are we're so proud of and we think so highly of but yet English is a limited language in many ways uh, we use the word love and the word love uh, is one of the most in the English language uh, most overused and misunderstood understood words uh, that we have uh, when we speak the word love we really don't even understand it many times in the context of the English language what do you mean well we look at it and say I love God I love my wife I love my dog I love hunting I love food come on everything we we love which one does it which is which amen how, how do we mean it well I know how I mean it pastor but the word does not truly convey the true meaning did you hear what I said 
The word does not really convey the true meaning. In fact, uh, it's one of the areas I think the English language could have a lot of help when if we had different words for love. Uh, in the Bible, there are seven words uh, that are used for love in the Greek language that are used in the Bible. They have different nuances. They actually are used all through the Bible, Old Testament, New, and they have different emphasis and different meanings. Uh, they don't just have a, a one word, love, to mean the same thing. Uh, and so when you begin to look in the Bible and you begin to study these words, Words, you begin to find some unique things uh, in the Bible. And I want to talk to you for real quick about those seven words uh, before I get into my message. Uh, the seven words in the Bible for love, uh, the first one is eros. Uh, eros actually means a romantic love. Uh, it is an intense sexual desire that is someone is found uh, that is found in newlyweds but can also be found in the flesh. Today we would call it lust. Regardless, uh, eros became, uh, uh, can become a very dangerous type of love outside of the marriage if not handled quickly and not reined in. In fact, two examples of eros found in the Old Testament was when Samson, who slept with the harlots according, according to Judges 16 and 1, and Delilah in 16 and 6. The Bible says uh, he had such a uh, compelling lust, uh, uh, a desire for her that she was able to deceive him and able to trick him because she was his enemy and he could not see the truth uh, that she was not his friend, that she did not care for him because of his desire for her. The other one was David and Bathsheba. When David saw Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop, uh, his lust and desire for her uh, overrode his thinking uh, and overrode his moral judgments and he committed great sin that caused caused him to go on and commit murder and even greater transgressions before God. This love, though it is good in marriage, is terrible outside of the marriage. The second type of love found in the Bible is philea. Philea is an affectionate love. This is a love that uh, doesn't have any kind of a sexual impulse or, or passion. It is the love that is between good friends and known in the Bible as Christian love, the love we have for brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a strong Strong, caring, a, a, a strong affection, a strong a desire to help. This love is shown greatest in the Bible in three incidences in Luke and Matthew where the centurion soldier asked Jesus uh, that if he would heal his ser servant. Uh, the servant wasn't his family. The servant wasn't uh, his, his mate. Uh, the servant was just a servant to him. But yet his affection for his servant caused him to go to Jesus and say, come and heal my servant. I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. Just say the word and I know my servant will be healed. Again found in Matthew the men who let down the man who was lame through the rooftop when they couldn't get to Jesus. He was not their kin. He was not anything other than a friend to them but they knew his condition and their love and compassion for him was so great that they climbed up on top of the roof and broke the roof open to let him down to Jesus. The same was also shown of the good Samaritan. Uh, this type of love calls the good Samaritan to stop on the roadside and help a total stranger that he did not love. Uh, phileo is a love of the church uh, and it is a uh, love that we need today. Uh, the third type of love uh, is called storgy. Storgy was a familiar love. Uh, it has to do with family and the, the, the love that a family has uh, for one another. It's greater than phileo because uh, we may love a friend or a brother but the love for our family, for our, our children, our moms and our dads, our brothers and sisters is greater because of, of that blood connection. And that love transcends blood. It also transcends uh, uh, differences. It's shown in Ruth uh, with Ruth and Naomi whenever the Bible said that whenever Ruth uh, lifted up her eyes, uh, her voice and clave to her mother-in-law and would not leave because uh, of the family connection. It's also seen in Jairus uh, in the synagogue where the leader came and begged Jesus uh, for his 12-year-old daughter's life. Uh, this love expands uh, and grows in families. Uh, the fourth type of love is pragma. Pragma is that enduring and true love. Uh, it is also known as the second greatest love. Uh, not the greatest, but the second greatest. Uh, this is the love that is birthed uh, between a husband and a wife. Uh, this is the love that God gave Adam uh, for Eve. Uh, 
paradigma. This is that love that when it goes through life, and if you're married here, you understand this, uh, that when the money moons over, euros uh, has been spent out. You know, that, fla that desire you had when you first got married, uh, it's gone. But honey, pragma is the love that stands the test of time. It's the kind of love that a husband and wife have even after years of marriage. They still want to hold hands. They still want to kiss. They still want to be beside each other. It's the kind of love me and my wife have. After 34 years, I still get a tickle when she comes and takes my hand. I still get a thrill when she touches the back of my head. It's the kind of love that is a lasting love. It's an enduring love. It's a love that doesn't start off strong, but it grows with time. And as time goes by, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger. It is the second of the all greatest loves. This love is seen in Jacob and Rachel in the Bible. If you remember the story of Jacob, when he found Rachel, he fell in love with her and he wanted to marry her. He desired her. He had Euro's love for her, but his love would become a, a, a greater than Euros, his love would become a, a love that was a pragma love because he worked seven years for her and then whenever he went in he broke up betrayed by his father-in-law and found out he was married to his sister Leah and not to Rachel but yet he loved Rachel so much that pragma love that he worked another seven years 14 years of servitude to get the one he loved that love that grows that love Love that is so great and is so fulfilling. It is also found in the love of Ruth and Boaz. In the book of Ruth and Boaz, after Boaz agreed to marry Ruth, their love became such an endearing love through their marriage that according to Chronicles, that they would live to see their son Obed grow into a man and have their grandson Jesse, who would grow into a man and have their great grandson David before they died. Their love endured. Their love was pragma. The fifth type of love is a dangerous, most dangerous and common love of all. It is called philutria. Philutria is the self-love desire that makes one's flesh happy. This was the love of money. The love of fame falls into this category. This is the attributes that we would accrue to our pets or our property or our achievements. This this love is dangerous above all others because it can blind us to true love. In fact, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. This type of love is the root of all kinds of evil which, uh, he said, which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This, this love is dangerous because it's that love that causes us to put other things before God and we lose the true love that God has for our lives. The sixth type of love is called ludus. Ludus is that playful, uncommitted love. It is known as the Jezebel love. It is the second most dangerous love there is. Why? It is a love that flirts and teases as long as it's fun and brings about the desired effect. It's the love we feel when we first start dating, when we first start going out with somebody, when we first start feeling attraction to that person. It's playful, but it's uncommitted. It's not rooted yet. The danger of this love and the reason it is known as a jealous Jezebel love is because it leads to manipulation to control the outcome of fleshly desire. In other words, it causes, if it doesn't work the way I want it, to try to make it work the way I want it. And many times in relationships, people find and fall into the trap of this type of love to where they try to control it through manipulation and it never ends well. And finally, the seventh type of love in the Bible that is listed is called agape love. This is the greatest of all loves. This is known as the love of God. It is an unconditional love. It is a 
perfect love. It is a universal love that has a selfless love for others. And Jesus was the perfect example of this love when he died on the cross to save us from sin and death. He suffered because of agape love that you and I could be redeemed from our sins. Can somebody say amen? Agape is the greatest love of all. And this love goes beyond anything you and I can truly comprehend. It is that love that pierced the veil. It is that love that transcends time. It is that love that allows the Son of God to hang upon the cross of Calvary. It is that love that allowed him to be beaten. It is that love that allowed him to be spit upon. It is that love that allowed him to be mocked and ridiculed. It is that love that allowed him while he was hanging in torment upon the cross to look up to his heavenly father and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It is a love that transcends all the evil in the world. It is a love that's greater than any devil there is. It is a love that's greater than any demonic spirit. It is a love that will heal and save and redeem the lost to them because it is an unconditional love that says, I love you no matter what and I'm willing to forgive you. The love of God, that unconditional love. When you begin to look at these loves and you look at the greatest love in the Bible, there are five things real quick this morning that I want to share with you. Five ways that God demonstrates that greatest love. And the first and the greatest way is that love of salvation. The agape love of salvation. In John 3, 16, the Bible said, For God so loved agape, the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This love is found all the way back in the beginning of time when God created Adam and Eve, when he gave them everything they could desire, when they lived in perfect help and perfect harmony, when they walked in the midst of the garden and he come in the evening time and walk with them and commune with them and fellowship with them and everything was perfect. They had the tree of life. They could live forever. They would never get sick. They would never grow old. God provided for everything they could desire and with his great love he said I give you everything but the one thing of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that's for me. Don't mess with that. Don't eat of that tree. Everything else is yours because I love you so much. I created you. I created this whole world. I created everything in it for you. That is my love, my agape love for you. But let me show you where the agape love really became true in the sense of understanding we have today is after Adam and Eve sinned, after they were tempted by Satan, after they took the tree in Eden, after they had hid themselves from the very one who created them, the very one who had made them. They knew they had done wrong. They hid in fear. How oh, my Lord, Justin was talking about how awesome it is for a father to see you in your good and your bad and still call you his child and love you. But you're on the other side of that, how often when we fail and when we know we've done wrong, we want to hide it. We want to run away from it. We don't want to stand it. Even though the father will look past our failures and say, I love you, we want to hide. My son was actually preaching on my message because I thought, yes, that is so true. You don't understand that a lot of times when we walked into that garden that day, he knew where they were at, but he called to them. They're hiding from him. They have run from him. They are afraid of him. Why? He's never given them anything but love and care, but sin and come in there. But do you know what? After it was all said and done, he didn't kill them. He didn't destroy them. He didn't and throw them away. He forgave them and he blessed them anyway. And they had a son named Cain and they had another son named Abel. What do you say? And they had a third son named Seth and they had other sons, sons and daughters. What are you saying, Pastor? Even though they had failed, even though they had sinned, even though he had rejected God, God never quit loving them. The good news for you today is I don't care who you are. I don't care what you've done. The God I serve is so great that Jesus never stops loving you. He loved them. 
For God so loved us. Now greater love hath no man, but God loved so much that he gave his only son, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, the son of God. And Jesus, that listen, that those who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now listen to verse 17. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus, through Jesus might be saved. That's agape love. We can't understand agape love. We struggle with it. Oh, I got agape love, pastor. Are you sure? What about that neighbor? that made you mad and offended you. Oh, come on. Hello. What about that person at work that hurt your feelings or did you wrong or cheated you or lied on you? What about that family member that you still hold a grudge against? Come on, church. Uh, honey, agape love uh, says I'm willing to give everything the very best I have so that you cannot perish, uh, so that you can be saved. Uh, glory to God. Uh, oh, listen to even Jesus said uh, some would die for a good man or might die for a man or preventure would die for a good man. Uh, but there's very few people that would die for somebody they don't like. Uh, honey, I want to tell you something. Most of us, uh, if it was, uh, if we have to do, oh, I'll protect my family, but I'm not going to worry about the rest of them. Uh, oh, what, a, what kind of love does God have when the world had turned its back on him, when the world had rejected him, when they had went to false gods uh, and false religions uh, and they had disobeyed his law and they had rejected his word and yet he still loved you and I enough uh, that he sent his only begotten son to die on an old rugged cross because he said I want to redeem them to me I love them so much even though they've done me wrong I want to redeem them I want to bring them back into the fold I want them to be forgiven honey I want to tell you and that a copy love is still real today and God is still saying if they'll only let me I'll forgive them and bring them back to me how great is that love he believes on him he who believes in Jesus is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, God said, I'm trying to make a way that you do not be condemned. And all you got to do is believe. This is agape love, the love of salvation. Romans 5, 8, 9. But God demonstrated his own love toward us. That in while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. That's a godly love, church. That love that sur surpasses time, surpasses failure, surpasses sin. The second part of that agape love after the salvation love is God shows his agape love through the abiding love that gives hope. I read it to you in John 15, 9 through 12. Has the Father loved me? I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. That abiding love gives hope. That abiding love reminds us that if we will abide in him, there is hope, there is strength. He gives that abiding love into our hearts. Listen to what Paul said at Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access to, by faith into the grace with which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance or patience and perseverance or patience produces character and character hope and hope does not disappoint why because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us that agape love is a love of abiding hope glory to God when you've asked Jesus into your heart that love is there and says I know where you're at I know what you're going through I know the struggles you are but I'm the chief pain breaker. I'm the pain taker. I'm the one that will never leave you locked in a prison of sin. If you will trust in me, I, 
I'll set you free. There's always hope in me. Honey, I want to tell you, if the enemy can kill your hope, he can destroy your life. But I want to tell you, hope, faith, hope, and love abide. And the greatest of these is love. And the love of God gives my hope strength. And my hope keeps my faith strong in God. The third evidence that love is the evidence love. The third way God demonstrates his agape love for us is the evidence love. The evidence love comes from knowing God. What do you mean, Pastor? Well, look at it. In Matthew, he said at 26, or 22, 36 through 39, Teacher, which is the greatest commandments of the law? And Jesus said to him, This is the evidence of knowing God. Number one, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. The word there used is agape love. You shall love the Lord with the same kind of love, the greatest love there is, that he is first. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is one of the most unique passages of Scripture in the Bible. When he says love God, Nothing can become before God. He says, love him with all your heart, with an unconditional love, with a perfect love. You love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Hello? Glory to God. You can't have a greater love than that. But when he tells you to love your neighbor, he says, love your neighbor differently. He says, love your neighbor. What? As yourself. Ooh, glory to God. You know, there's a, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Come on. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Honey, if you'll begin to treat people and love people the way you love yourself, hello, treat them the way you want to be treated, what, we, what a change we'd make in this world. What a difference we'd make in this world. It amazes me that people cannot get past the hangups of today. I'm finna step off into it so y'all get ready. The greatest example of the evidence love from knowing God, Jesus himself tells it in Luke chapter 10, verses 29 through 37. Maybe we ought to go back and study it. We know the story. A lot of people, even not in church, know the story. But we fail to have the understanding of the evidence love that is there. I want to read it to you right quick. He said, wanting to justify himself before Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down to Jerusalem from Jericho and fell among the thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. I want you to notice that he said the man went down from, Jer from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, he doesn't say what nationality the man was. He doesn't give an indication of what his status in life was, rich, poor, smart, dumb, nothing like that. He doesn't tell anything but that a man went down from Jerusalem. But the indication is that he was probably a Jew because he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. That was the understanding of the story. And the Bible said that he fell among thieves. Now, verse 31, the Bible said by certain chance, a by chance, a certain priest, this was a religious person. It was people of who claimed to be religious. They came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. I don't want to get too close. Don't want to see this. Likewise, a Levite. A Levite was a Jew. It was one of the tribes of the Jews. So he's making it very plain. The next person was actually one of a Jew, which indicates that the man that came from Jerusalem was also a Jew. And he says, a Jew. And when he arrived at the place, he came and looked and passed on by the other side. But a certain Samaritan, a Samaritan was a person of different race. And actually, they were considered to be half-breeds. They looked down on them because they were part Jew and part of another nationality. They were called Samaritans. But at this time, Samaritans was actually a nation or group of people. And they were hated by the Jews because of their 
half-breed status or because uh, they came from a different group of people. And as he journeyed, uh, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And so he went to him and bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine uh, and set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day, when he departed, the Samaritan party, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So Jesus said, so which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And the man said, he who showed him mercy, then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Can I tell you something, church? I do not understand how people can say they have the agape love of God in their heart and that evidence love, that knowing God love, and still have racial problems in their heart and their lives because my Bible clearly shows me right here. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what part of the world you come from. It doesn't matter how smart or how dumb, or how educated or uneducated, how rich or poor or how famous or what you have or don't have. What matters is that's the soul there and God loves every soul. I'm telling you, I am sick and tired of people saying, well, we don't want this group. Let me tell you something. As long as I'm the pastor, whosoever will, let them come to the house of the Lord. I want to tell you, I grew up singing a song, God loves the little children of the world. Red, yellow, black, and white, they are precious in his eye. I want to tell you, the church has got to grow up in the love of God and get over this junk because no one group is better than anybody else. We're all the children of God. My Lord. It bothers me that we still have people that look around. I was talking with, with a pastor, and he was telling me the issues of racism that they're dealing with today. He said, how do you deal with it? I said, there's nothing to deal with. I said, as far as my concern, they are the same as I am with God. Hey, the last time I looked, everybody still had one head, two arms, two hands, two legs, two feet, two eyes a nose and a two ears and a mouth. They all red bled blood out of their body. I want to tell you something. We got to get past what is different on the outside and start looking for Jesus on the inside. The love of God is more concerned about the heart. Jesus said in John chapter 13, a new commandment I give you. Does anybody else hear that? John 13, verse 34. St. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. You ought to mark it in your Bible. Look at it. A new commandment. I don't think we heard that. What is a commandment? Anybody? Have I not got y'all all too nervous? Can I tell you a commandment ain't this? Well, if you feel like it. I mean, you know, if you don't mind. <laughs> Let me ask any of the military people I got in here. <laughs> if the colonel walked up to you and you were active duty and said, do this. Is that a suggestion or a commandment? <laughs> it's an order. And an order is a commandment. That's what an order is. It is a commandment. Y'all didn't hear me. Come on. I got people that have been in the military. I got people recently in the military out here. I got people that assert they will tell you right now. Listen, I know what the, I know the rule. It, all orders must be justifiable. Listen, I understand that. But let me tell you something. That first sergeant gave me an order. That company commander gave me an order. That colonel gave me an order. It didn't matter who it was. The higher up it got, the quicker that order was obeyed. Hello? Come on now. Your squad leader, who's the same rank as you, 
but he's got seniority by five months, gives you an order, you obeyed it, but you might walk off. <laughs> that platoon sergeant walked up there and gave you an order. Yes, platoon sergeant, he'd get going. That first sergeant walked up there and gave you a, yes, first sergeant, and you jumped. The company commander and on up, y'all know what I'm talking about that's been in the military? You followed the order. It wasn't something, well, I want to, <laughs> I don't know, they might do that in the Army today, I don't know. God help them. Because I'm under, my understanding today, they can't touch you. Well, somebody didn't tell my drill sergeant that. Son, he, my first day in the, in the Army, after I got off that plane, he beat my forehead black and blue right here with that bill of hat. He was in my face spitting all over me. And I'm sitting, you know what I was doing? God, what am I doing here? Oh, my God. I, I should have listened to Mama and not signed that line, dotted line. Oh, did you hear me, Smith? Yes, first sergeant. Or, yes, sergeant. First time I told him, he said, yes, sir. Oh, you don't call a sergeant, sir, not a drill sergeant. I don't know about the Marines, but our drill sergeants, if you wanted to get in trouble, just call them, sir. They'd tell you right quick, I work for a living. You don't call me, sir, I'm a drill sergeant. <laughs> Rice was over here nodding his head. He understands what I'm going through. Let me tell you something. I couldn't dream of telling one of them, I'm not going to listen to that order. I'm not going to follow that command. Mm, glory to God. If you disobeyed an order, you better know for sure, beyond any shadow of a doubt, to, that you were standing on the right thing. Glory to God. And you were justified. And you better be able to prove it. Well, you see something, church, I find in the Bible. Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment. It's not up to option. It's not something you get to decide if you like or not. It's not something you need to think about. It's just something you need to follow and carry out. He said, this new order is simply this, that you love one another as I have loved you and that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Can I tell you something, church? The evidence love doesn't wait till they get saved and get to fit in your little profile for you to start loving them. God says you're to love them. You don't have to love the sin. You don't have to love the past, but you got to love the soul. You got to love the soul. You got to love them. Glory to God. Let me tell you something. We have struggled in the church loving one another. I want to tell you something. We're going to be different and thank God we're all different because I want to tell you if we were all the same we would be in a world of hurt. I like that we're different but we've got to love one another even though we are different. We must learn to love with the love of God. Can somebody say amen? Number four, the greater are giving love. Jesus shows the agape love in what is called the greater or are giving love. It is also known as the committed love. This was the type of love that Jesus desired for all of his disciples. He finds it in John 15 and 13. Greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down one's life for his friends. In John 17, 26, Jesus said, I have declared to them your name and will declare it for the love with which you love me may be that the love which you, with which you love me may be in them and I in them. This love is the giving love or committed love. You know, it takes commitment to lay down your life. It takes commitment to be able to step in front and give for someone else. And yet this love seems to be a love that we struggle with. The greater love is a giving love. It's a committed love. How committed are we? How committed to God? How committed to the ministry? How committed to our family? How committed to our church? How committed to our friends? How committed are we? This love is a commitment love. And God says it is the greater or giving love, that love of commitment. And it is best shown in the Bible in Luke where Jesus tells the story. And the disciples are at the synagogue and he sees a little widow woman coming. And he looks at them giving in the offering. And the little, women, little woman 
excuse me, gives two pennies, two mites was all that she had, and yet Jesus recognized her, and he calls his disciples and says, look, do you see that little widow woman? I tell you, she gave more than all the rest. Why? Because she gave from commitment. She gave from the abundance of her heart. She was so committed that she was willing to give all that she had. Glory to God. Oh, we'll tip God, but we're not that committed yet. Hello? Wow, I felt that one too. I'm not preaching on tithes and offering. I'm telling you that's where it's in the Bible. A committed love. This was a love. He said he talked about the love that the widow woman had that she would give. She was so committed to give from the abundance of her heart. That's what commitment is, to give your best, to give what is necessary, to give what is needed, to give what God asked you to give. You know what I found out a lot of times? God's not trying to get you to give everything. You didn't hear me. Listen to me. God really doesn't want you to give everything. Y'all didn't hear me. Somebody said, you need to listen to this. God does not want you to give everything. Well, Pastor, you just said a little woman woman gave everything. She did. Well, you're telling me God don't want me to give everything? No, he don't. He just wants you to be willing if that's what he asks of you to give everything. Now be careful because if you say I'm willing, he may test you just to see if you're willing. That's what he did with Abraham. Take your son, your only son Isaac that I gave you and go offer him a sacrifice. God wasn't going to let him sacrifice. God just wanted the willing heart. Honey, and when God sees the willing heart that you're willing to do it, God may tell you to give everything and wait till you get right here to drop it in the basket and say, okay, hold it. Now I'm going to provide for you because I see that you're actually willing to do what I asked you to do. The reason I'm talking about money is because, i am be honest with you, the quickest way that we can get, a, get upset in a church is somebody try to take our money. Hello. Come on now. Glory to God. George is one of my best friends. George, I've known George for 54 years. Most of y'all know him too. He's been to church with me every time I've been here. He comes every Sunday. I was giving him when I was, when I, when, hey, when I was going to nursery, my mom and daddy was sending George with me to the offering. He still comes, glory to God. But I want to tell you, I ain't seen too many bins. Hello. Some of y'all get that in a minute. Commitment, the love, and finally the last one is they're playing. The last love of agape that God shows us. I read it to you. John 15, 9 through 12. It is that assurance. It is that perfect love. Agape love of God gives us an assurance. And it only comes from the Spirit and from God. And the Father loved me. I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Pastor, how's that assurance? The joy of the Lord is what? Our strength. Can I tell you something? When you don't have hope, when you don't have peace, when you don't have assurance, you can have no joy. When fear is there, you cannot have true joy. But what did he say about perfect love? It cast out all fear. Joy. Joy is strength. Joy is the love that God gives you perfect love of his 
that he's wrapped his arms around you and when you have troubles and t trials that come your way you're like David weeping may endure for the night but because the love of God has surrounded me I know joy I know joy I know joy is coming in the morning stand with me all over this house Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and I do not have love, I have become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but I do not have love, I have am nothing and though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned but have not love it profits me nothing why love suffers long and love is kind love does not envy love does not parade itself love is not puffed up love does not behave rudely Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked, and love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never fails. And now abide faith hope and love these three but the greatest of these is love if you can let the love of God shine in your heart you have the greatest weapon the greatest tool and the greatest treasure you will ever find in this life or the next God's love that unconditional agape love we need more of it in the world today can someone say amen give the Lord a hand clap of praise I want you to pray with me father as we come to you right now father I know it's Valentine's Day many people are off celebrating and Father, but the greatest love was given to us <laughs> from the very beginning. When you created life, when you made us in the image and likeness of God, that unconditional love that looks over our failures and mistakes, that love that Pastor Justin spoke about, of a father looking at his child and even the good times and the bads, you still love and still care. That love that transcends time. That love that is still here today that will still take away sins. That will still make hold again. That love that will bring the prodigal home and say, it's okay. I forgive you. I'm just glad you're home. Father, that's the love I pray for our church. That's the love I pray for our people, God. That's the love I desire in our lives. And God, I pray that you would let the Golden Isles Church of God be a church of that love, that unconditional love that will reach out to a lost and dying world, no matter who they are, no matter where they're from. Father, and say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus, the one who loves you, the one who died for you, the one who gave us all for you. Father, I pray, God, that that love would be birthed in our hearts. And that we would share that love, not just within ourselves, but Father, let us share it with all those that we come in contact with. Let it grow, Father, and let it blossom in every heart and every life, for no greater love can be found than the love of God. Jesus, I pray now, let your love shine in us. We ask it in Christ Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. And amen. One more time, would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise?
Is there anyone who needs special prayer this morning?